So it's an honor to be here, and I want to thank the Chamber of Commerce, sir. I want to thank you. I enjoy your show. I do listen to it, and I learn a lot uh, because that's what it's about, right? It's about, as a public servant, listening and learning, and then doing your best to represent everybody in the most positive way so that our livelihoods are improved and the future of our children and grandchildren are secure. And I believe that there's three huge problems that are interfering with our livelihood today as well as the future of our children and grandchildren. And as I have been campaigning for two years in this state, over two years now, in every town and city in this state multiple times, doing over 50 town halls, four town halls since the primary election, I have found the three problems by listening and learning and observing. Inflation, inflation, inflation. That's the problem. And that problem has been created by the failed policies, energy policies, of Joe Biden. And my opponent, my opponent, has voted with him 100% of the time. And I intend on going down to Washington, D.C. and reversing those policies to bring back our livelihood and the future of our children and, general, and grandchildren. And general, God bless you. Well, God bless you. Minutes. You can stay right there. All right. <laughs> uh, and yet, uh, when I, whenever we go over two minutes, I'll, I'll say, uh, and to the end of your uh, sentence. Yes, sir. All you right. got it. <laughs> okay. Um, let's jump right into the questions. Uh, question one. Uh, inflation, which you just spoke to, will be asked by panelist Matt Burdett. Matt? Yes, sir. Inflation is obviously at the top of voters' minds as we head in toward the November 8th midterm election. The country has not seen numbers this high in 40 years, and inflation is hitting New Hampshire businesses especially hard. A two-part question. What do you think about the Inflation Reduction Act signed into law in August, and will it actually reduce inflation? And what else can the federal government do to reduce inflation? Well, I have renamed the Inflation Reduction Act the IRS Expansion Act. 87,000 agents at the expense of everything else going on, targeting Americans and Granite Staters that make less than $100,000. It's not an Inflation Reduction Act because every every aspect of our society, energy and taxes for middle class go up. They go up. 20 million for people that make under $100,000. That was that was what I what I read today. That's unacceptable. It's not an Inflation Reduction Act. It's an act that creates debt burdening on Granite Staters and Americans, and it's absolutely unacceptable. And where we got there and how we got there was because we reversed sound energy policies of the previous administration. That is why we have inflation, inflation, and inflation. Whole goods just went up today. Gas just went up today. Men and women, moms and dads, retirees, are now being forced to choose between heating and eating. It's unacceptable. I was just up in Twin Mountain yesterday talking to a family who just lost their home. Them and their three children had to move into a three-room apartment, forced out of their home because they can't afford it anymore. They could afford it two years ago. Looking at her eyes, watching them well up with water, trying to figure out how they're gonna feed their children, it's unacceptable. And that has been brought to us by Joe Biden with the full support of Senator Hassan. We need to reverse this. We need to stop the out of control spending. That's the problem. And that's how we get to a solution. And that's the end of the sentence, right on time. Okay. General, uh, question number two, workforce housing, uh, will be asked by panelist Lucille Jordan. We are hearing a lot from our businesses in recent months about the rising costs of rent in the state 
and the near impossibility for renters to find available housing. Vacancy rates are as low as 0.5%. What is the federal government's responsibility to incentivize workforce housing in New Hampshire? Well, first and foremost, it's to reverse our energy policies so that we can bring down inflation and bring up opportunity. The federal government needs to get out of the state's way so the states can, can freely, without over-regulation, bring in other companies that's going to create a workforce and it's going to create the demand necessary and the money necessary for people to build rentals, for people to build homes. You know, right now, right now, my family is no different than any other family that I talk to, or most families that I talk to in New Hampshire. My son is 27 years old. He owns his own, own business. He's very successful. He can't afford health care, so he's not under any health care. That's terrible. But worse, he's living with us because he can't afford the rent because of inflation, because of lack of, of availability. And because of previous policies for two and a half years during COVID, which stifled any growth and caused renters, people who own properties, not to go without money. And then we turn around and we get rid of that policy and we force people out of their homes because they can't afford it anymore. We're not bringing in young people. There's no new technology, no new nothing. And when I go out and I talk to workforce uh, manufacturers like I have done routinely for two years and four since I uh, got into the, the general election they can't get people there so if you don't even have a workforce because that workforce is being forced to stay home because not forced they get incentives and I'm all about hand up I'm all about helping people I did that for 33 and a half years in the military I helped men women and children live and survive and save their lives so we got to get the government out of the way and we got to incentivize businesses by bringing down inflation and yeah, we can end to that sentence yes sir uh general i'm just curious where did your dog go that you came in with <laughs> he is uh very obediently sitting over at that table over there okay very good <laughs> yes sir <laughs> all right let's go to question number three uh, workforce uh, will be asked by panelist uh, Steve Chasing. Yes, sir. Lack of available workforce continues to be a major issue for New Hampshire employers of all sizes and virtually all sectors. Are there ways the federal government can alleviate New Hampshire workforce challenges? Yeah, again, lower inflation. Uh, work on the big three problems, inflation, inflation, inflation. Well, first of all, you, got, you don't even have anybody coming uh, in, as you and I discussed at your business, uh, and uh, you know, I fully understand that. Senator Hassan got asked two days ago at a business she was at, hey, that's great, you're talking about all the stuff you did, but why can't, why can't we get workforce? And you can't get workforce because they're incentivized to stay home. And again, so my words don't get snipped and taken out of context, right? I believe in a hand up, but not a hand out. And right now, people are being incentivized not to go back to work, and we got to get rid of that. we got to change the national narrative that don't tread on me and hard work is our national value, not staying home. Not trying to get a job and try and get employers to pay more than you're actually worth. You have to earn that. And we need a society today that actually says, if you work hard and you do a good job, you're going to get paid. And that is your business, not the federal government's business. And my opponent has got in the way of that every step of the way, every step. Recently, she just voted against expanding the workforce. In August, she just she just did a series of votes that precludes people from going back to work, that actually supports people to stay home, that actually hurts your businesses. This is wrong, and it needs to change. This is a country that was made by its hands and by you and the will of the people. Hard-working Americans from 1776 on, we need that same kind of spirit reinvested today. And that comes with people who actually believe in the Declaration of Independence and God-given rights. Thank you.
Yeah, you're on time. Okay. Question number four, Don. Uh, energy uh, will be asked by panelist Matt Burdett. According to New Hampshire's Business and Industry Association, New Hampshire electrical energy prices are nearly 60% higher than the national average. Our businesses are facing a crisis in energy costs driven by a lack of avail available supply in our region. Such costs make it difficult for businesses to put uh, make it difficult for businesses and put businesses at a disadvantage. What is the federal government's responsibility in ensuring infrastructure and to reduce the overall cost of energy? Well, first of all, we've got to change the decisions. I don't even call what this administration does policy, right? They are deliberate decisions that have made us energy dependent and have created inflation in every aspect of our lives, which has driven up costs, drove people out of their homes, created mothers across this state to, be, to have to make decisions between health care, school supplies, heating, and eating. Smaller portions so their kids can get three meals a day. Or skipping meals so their kids can get three meals a day. We're coming up to a very, very critical time. After the midterms, the cost of electrical is going to go up. It's going to double in December. It's already out there. Unless we do something about it on November 8th. Unless we say enough is enough, right? Your policies, your decisions, your voting. See, this is the biggest problem. We reverse the energy problem we have. XL pipeline, permits, leases, exploration. We do the right thing there. We're going to lower it, and that's going to be great. You know, the easiest thing to do as an elected official is to go in and hit yay or nay. Hit yay or nay. The hard thing is to get in front of people that you have negatively affected as a result of that yay and nay. Sure, as a military officer, I said, go attack that hill. That's an easy decision for me to make in my headquarters, but it's an awful hard thing to deal with when your men and women come back in body bags or stretchers, and then you have to talk to the family. We have people in Washington, D.C. right now that don't think beyond the end of their nose about the consequences of their voting. And this question, um, Don, is near to the, dear to the hearts of many here in Nashua. It's rail. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be asked by panelist Lucille Jordan. Thank you. Expanded rail is on the minds of New Hampshire businesses as a means to bring more workforce into the state each day. A rail study is to come out in January. Do you support rail expansion in New Hampshire and do you see a path for the federal government to fund expanded rail? How will you ensure federal funding to bring rail to New Hampshire happens? Mm -hmm. So, pure and simple and straightforward. The study comes out in January. I am undecided about this issue. But what I am very concerned about is everywhere else in this country they have done it and the federal government has gotten involved, it has caused the taxpayer dollars, taxpayers to pay significantly more money for a failed rail system. So we need to listen to people and I will do that. I will have town halls and I'll listen to people. And if the federal government can help in a way that doesn't doesn't cause problems because I believe that the federal government every time they get involved in something there is a better than 99% chance they're going to cause you big problems. <laughs> this is an issue for the state. This is an issue for Granite Staters. This is an issue for the men and women that I'm looking around here that serve in our legislature and the ones that are running that want to serve that are in here. And you got to decide, but remember, you are still paying for failed rail in New Mexico, failed rail in California, failed rail in Ohio, for the same reasons. It didn't work. And all of the bills, after it was built, and everybody made their money, the people got stuck with higher taxes and paying the bill. That's what we have to be responsible about, and that's what I will do. Thank you. Okay. Question, uh, 
Question number six, the final question in this uh, series of questions, Don. Uh, U.S. borders will be asked by panelist Steve Chasey. Migration across U.S. borders with Mexico and Canada, Canada, especially the United States-Mexico border, continues to be an issue that looks for a workable solution. While the borders differ, differ significantly because of our long, close economic ties with Canada and the difference in numbers, there is migration across both borders. What is your position on fixing the broken immigration system and what actions as our New Hampshire representative and the federal government will you take to fix this broken system? Yeah, so this is how I feel about it at the federal level. And first and foremost at the federal level, we have to secure our border. And we need a wall system to do that. And that takes air, land, and sea assets that are insufficient right now. It takes people. And that's inefficient right now. But we're certainly going to get 87,000 more I IRS agents now, aren't we? And Senator Hassan just voted against nixing that and sending the number of personnel and the $80 billion to the Border Patrol so that they could do their job better. And she voted no. That needs to be a yes. That's a huge problem. And it's, it's the biggest problem, manning the border, both borders. The borders and points of entry in this country are being, uh, are being hurt because we have to move people to the southern border because they don't have enough agents. They don't have enough personnel. Another thing she just voted against was additional technology to stop and detect opioids at the borders. We have a 200% increase in the opioid crisis here. We have cartels making $13 billion on human trafficking. We have immigrants coming to this country being raped and killed because of the current border policies that she supports. Open borders all the way around. The siphoning of personnel that are supposed to be doing their jobs elsewhere. This is absolutely wrong. I worked on the border. I did that job. I know what those people come with. We've got to support our law enforcement at the federal, state, and local level so that they can help us with the opioid crisis, the drug problem, the other illicit trafficking, which now they can't because their hands are tied. This is a huge, huge problem, and I will go down there to fix it. I've seen it in real life. Thank you. Okay, okay. Now, we have some questions from the audience. Oh, I absolutely. have them in my hand. Yes, sir. These are the same questions that were asked Maggie when oh, she was okay. up here. So Great. we'll ask them of you. Uh, do you have two minutes to respond to each one? Okay. Uh, so let's do uh, the first one is from Rita. Uh, how are you communicating with Granite Staters? Well, I've been communicating with Granite Staters pretty effectively over the last two years. I've been doing it because I get out on the ground and I visit every town and city uh, in this state. I participate in community activities political activities, but most importantly, town halls, 50 during the primary, where I drew in Democrats, independents, Republicans, young people, old people, you name it. It didn't matter. They wanted to hear what I had to say in town halls, where nothing was monitored, nothing was, uh, was orchestrated. Tough questions from Granite Staters, regardless of their political party, their age, that are concerned about the direction of this state and this country. I, I also doing that in the general election. And you can just look at it. Look at what I've done over the last 36 hours and then compare it to Senator Hassan over the last 36 weeks. You will find that I am there and she's not. And if you're gonna serve, you have to be there. I commanded 3,000 troops in Africa at my division level command in an area two and a half times the size of the United States in 28 different countries fighting our nation's terrorists. And I got to tell you, I got out there on the ground and listened to them so I could help them. I learned from them so I could help them. That's what public servants are supposed to do. I believe that it is my job to be a conduit for you in Washington, D.C., to be your ambassador in Washington, D.C., to communicate with you. And every time I come back to this state with the 242 days on the congressional calendar that are available to engage with Granite Staters, I will have a town hall 
and you will be able to come and ask me questions. Thank you. Right, we have, um, this question is from Charlie, and it, uh, it's two, twofold. Uh, what is your stand on climate mm -hmm. and on abortion? Okay, great, climate. So, hey, listen, I am a huge protector of the environment. I had to do it for 33 and a half years in the military. I remember as a private digging foxholes. We had to watch out for trees that had any red bands around them for the red-headed cockade woodpecker to how we got rid of our fuel, how we fueled our vehicles, how we did everything. I am very, very concerned about the environment. And I'm very conscious that businesses that come into areas like they have here in New Hampshire and polluted our water need to be held accountable by our federal government. And they're not. That's huge. And I know there's people in here that are affected by that. But I say that America does the best job in the world of protecting its environment. China, Russia, North Korea, Iran do not. So I plan on putting pressure on them. There's a problem. At the same time, being very aware of how that affects, but I believe the states should be responsible for it. The EPA at the federal level gets in their way with double standards and, and you, know, you know, everything that they do that interferes with states being able to put in stricter standards for their climate. I got grandchildren. I want them to enjoy the lakes and the air and the beauty of this great state. I'm not going to do anything to harm that. And then abortion was the other issue. Abortion. Listen, let me be clear. Everything you're seeing on the news or getting mailed to you by my opponent is an absolute lie. And I've been saying it since the Dobbs decision. I do not support a federal ban on abortion. It's a states' rights issue. The Supreme Court said so. Hey, that's the way it is. And I support our abortion law here. And women in this state, on both sides of the issue, will be better heard and better served at the state level than they would ever be served at the federal level. That's my answer, and that's the truth. So print that and put that out. Now, uh, from Ted, the question is, what is the most pressing issue for you, if you were to go to the Senate, to deal with in the next session of Congress? Uh, let's see. I'm not even sure what I'm going to say can be dealt with in one six-year period because of what's been done to us over the last two and a half years. You know, we have a saying in the military, it takes two to three times longer to fix something that you break. It's even harder at the government level. And they've broken. They've broken our energy and, uh, system. They've broken it. They've broken our border system, created high crime, opioid crisis. It's unbelievable what they have done. It's incredible the amount of damage that's been done. But if you're not going to go down there as an elected official to get your arms around inflation, 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 and return the standard of living to Granite Staters and Americans that they had two and a half years ago, then you're going down there for the wrong reasons. I need to serve you in that capacity. Be your conduit to change. Be your ambassador. Turn this around from focusing on Washington, D.C. and being a, a senator in Washington, D.C. to focusing on being a senator from the state of New Hampshire. That's important. But inflation, 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 reversing the energy crisis, stopping the out-of-control spending. And let me tell you what she just voted against in August. She voted against a bill that would have stopped spending until we got inflation under control. Did you hear that? Did you also hear that she voted for against a bill that would increase energy production? Did you hear that? That's what we need to do. We need to go down there and reverse those things. You know, they started out as executive orders, and now they're being overcome by bills and laws. And we can reverse that with a majority. Thank you.
questions that we asked Maggie that we've asked you, and so we're at the end of the uh, of the audience asking questions at this point. Um, Don, you now have two minutes for your closing comments. Thank you, and thank you for the questions. Uh, thank you, panel. That, that was excellent. Um, listen, my heart hurts. There are many people in here that don't know me, that judge me purely because of 33 years of service and think that I'm a heartless general who stands at the position of attention and follows orders and has no humanity and no compassion and no empathy. For those of you that do know me, know that that's not Don Baldick. That Don Baldick loves America and he loves Americans and he loves Granite Staters. And he will do anything he can to help people. During the COVID crisis, my wife and I volunteered in Manchester to deliver Meals on Wheels because they couldn't find drivers to do so. And I was exposed to a very sad portion of what bad policy can do to good people who look for meals every single day and live in housing that's substandard. And it breaks my heart. And it's why I'm running. It's why I got the idea in my mind to run, to help people. For 33 and a half years, I was sent overseas to help people, to build clinics and hospitals. I held dying women in my arms, dying babies in my arms, covered with flies in refugee camps because of bad government policies. I know what that looks like. I know what it feels like. I am here to represent you, to be your United States Senator, a job interview to serve you. God bless you, God bless America, and live free or die. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Thank you very much. We appreciate, uh, we appreciate your being with us this morning, and I wish you well in November. Well, I thank you, sir, and thank you for educating us on WMUR. I really appreciate it. And thank you for everything you all do here in the college, at Chassis Steel, which I'm very familiar with now. And I look forward to an interview with you, sir. God bless you. Thank you all.